Okay, so let's get started. There are a couple of slides from last time when we were talking about uh, code and process migration that I'm going to hold off until Monday. I wanted to uh, talk about communication in distributed system, discuss RPCs and so on because that is uh, directly related to whatever you're going to do in your lab uh, project or assignment. Okay, so that's what we're going to start today. We'll come back to uh, the, the two slides from last time uh, next week. Okay. So this is a new topic as far as the book is concerned. It's a new chapter. I'm going to start with an introduction to uh, communication and distributed system. Uh, we'll talk about message-oriented communication mostly in today's class and next class. I'll start with uh, some basic concepts and remote procedure calls. Next time I'm going to talk about uh, RMIs or remote method invocation. Okay, and then we'll also talk about stream-oriented communication such as that's used in audio and video streaming or the internet. Okay, so today we'll start with message-oriented communication. Now, uh, because uh, we are talking about distributed systems and distributed applications, we are assuming that uh, your application or system consists of multiple entities which are typically going to be processes. Your processes are going to communicate with one another to achieve whatever task they are uh, assigned. Okay, so if it's client server, so you may have a client process and a server process that are communicating. Communication can typically take one of two forms, what we call unstructured communication and structured communication. Okay, uh, structured communication is also referred to as message passing. Okay, entities communicate by sending messages back and forth. A message is simply uh, any string, any data that you send to the other entity. The other entity sends you another message back. A message could be a request, and a reply could be something that comes back to you. Okay. So that's structured communication. So that's a very common way of communication using uh, uh, IPCs or what's called inter-process communication or messages. Okay. There's also an implicit way to communicate which is called unstructured communication. So in this case, uh, you are is essentially using shared memory or shared data structures to communicate. Okay, You don't explicitly send messages, you send implicit messages. What does that mean? Let's say you have a buffer, you can put some data item into the buffer Okay, one entity, one process could put an item into the buffer. Some other entity comes and takes that uh, item from the buffer and does something with it. Okay? You didn't explicitly uh, send a message with the data item. You simply put it into a shared data structure that some other entity came and processed at some later time. That is also a form of communication as far as we are concerned. Uh, you are actually sending information between processes. In one case, it's done explicitly by sending a message to the process containing that information. In another case, information exchange is happening through shared data structures. Okay, so we are going to start talking about structured communication today, but keep in mind that uh, there is unstructured ways to communicate as well, which we will come back to in later classes. But every time we'll have to watch for that. Okay, so you are asking in an unstructured communication, would you have to watch for the object? Yes, you will have synchronization, there is a way to go and look for the object and so on. How to implement it is an orthogonal issue. It's conceptually, we are just saying that's one way for communication to take place. Okay. Now, the thing to keep in mind is because we are talking about a distributed system, all of this would require you to have some level of communication support. Okay. Now, why is that? Uh, in a distributed system, the processes could run on different machines. Okay. If these are processes running on the same machine, you don't actually need a network. You can communicate using either of these two forms on the local machine. These are processes that are just talking to one another. But since processes reside on different machines, you need communication support. So I'm going to spend two, three slides as a very quick refresher on uh, protocols and TCP, IP and whatnot. I'm assuming you are familiar with uh, some networking concepts. You don't need to know a whole lot, just some familiarity is good enough. Uh, and that's what we are going to talk about here. Okay. So processes that use explicit or communication or message passing are going to use some communication protocol. Okay. You must have heard of TCP IP or used it. That's an example of a protocol. Okay. What this slide is showing you is a, a, a picture of what is referred as a protocol stack. Okay, protocols are essentially rules for communication. That's an agreement between two parties on how to communicate. That's a protocol. Okay, so when you send a message, 
to another party the other party needs to know how to interpret that message it needs to know how what is in the message what the fields might be and that is essentially defined by the protocol itself which sort of is essentially the rules for communication okay. uh, protocols could be connection oriented or connection less an example of a connection oriented protocol is uh, tcp ip tcp is connection oriented the connection oriented protocol you first have to establish a connection between the two endpoints that are communicating before communication can take place In the communication less pro or a connection less protocol rather you can just send a message without establishing it. so so this is just a protocol example of a protocol stack you'll see that there are layers here okay, the physical layer is simply the wire that you use for communication or the wireless channel you use for communication that's the physical layer the three layers that are typically present in any protocol stack are the data link layer, network layer and transport layer. Example of data link layer could be something like Ethernet or Wi-Fi or cellular, uh, 3G, 4G. Those are all examples of uh, data link layer, MAC layer protocols. Okay. Network and transport protocols are where actually a lot of their uh, work happens in routing the message from the sender to the recipient or ensuring that once the message is reached, you are not missing packets and so on. Okay. Uh, IP is an example of a network layer protocol. It performs a hop by hop routing. Okay. Network layer protocols operate on a hop by hop basis. There may be multiple intermediaries between the sender and the receiver, which as you know are called routers. Okay, So when a packet arrives at a router, it needs to figure out where to send it next. So eventually the packet is going to go one step at a time and reach the destination. There's usually going to be a source address and a destination address. Just as when you send a letter, you actually have to write an address that allows it to get to its eventual destination. Same is true in any network layer protocol, including IP. A transport layer protocol is an end-to-end -end protocol where you have the two endpoints. No intermediaries participate typically in transport layer protocol. Your endpoints just that talk to one another saying, uh, send acknowledgement saying I received this packet or saying this packet is missing, resend it to me. Uh, or uh, uh, you can do things like flow control, which control the rate at which packets are being sent. You send something too fast, the packet may not have enough network bandwidth to get those packets across. So all of that functionality is implemented in the transport layer. Okay? Session and presentation layer we are going to come to. Application layer protocols are what the application stuff. So HTTP is an example of an application layer protocol. In this case, the browser, which is an application and the web server are communicating using HTTP, which itself runs on TCP IP as an example. Okay. So that's a very quick uh, overview. Okay. If you have questions, please ask. I'm assuming you know this. I'm just going through it quickly. Is connectionless same as stateless? Is connectionless same as stateless? Connectionless protocols are also stateless protocols. They are not the same thing. A state just means you keep track of who you are communicating with. Uh, connectionless simply says that in order for uh, an, uh, one party to send a message to another party, you do not have to first establish a connection. You can simply send a packet, it will get there. Okay. So uh, TCP IP, you will actually have to, I will show you an example of uh, TCP working, which you have to you establish a connection, only then can you send the first bit or the byte to the sender. So they are slightly different things. So like in HTTP you can maintain the state by setting one of the parameters to so will that be a connection full or state full? Okay. So question there's a question about HTTP which we haven't covered. We'll come back to HTTP when we do web. So HTTP uh, was designed initially as a request response protocol where you web browser sends a request, you get a reply back from the server. The first version of HTTP, which is 1.0, was a stateless protocol, okay? uh, which essentially meant that uh, the server didn't have to keep track of the state. HTTP 1.1 has something called a persistent connection, where after you send the first request, you do not tear down the uh, TCP connection, you keep it alive for you to send subsequent packets. Okay? So now that has made HTTP stateful because now you have a persistent connection. So the server knows there's a client connection live. Okay, so that's a way to think about it. Okay, uh, uh, this is just this slide is simply showing you the contents of what is a network packet look like. Okay, so uh, what is referred to as a message is also called a payload. That is the message that one party is sending to the other. 
your one entity, your client, or the server sending to one another. Now, as the message traverses down the protocol stack, each layer of your protocol stack is going to add some extra information, which is typically header and footer information to the message. Okay, so let's say this is your, uh, if you're doing HTTP, this is going to be your request saying, give me this HTML page or give me the JPEG image or whatever. Okay, so then it's going to have some sort of an HTTP header that HTTP is going to add on the cloud browser that is going to add to it. So that is essentially going to have some HTTP level information. So then the browser is going to hand this to, in this case, let's say the transport layer protocol, which could be TCP IP. So TCP IP, uh, the protocol is then going to add some uh, TCP headers onto this, okay, which is going to be some information that TCP maintains uh, between the two endpoints. Then it's going to go down the protocol stack to IP. You're going to add some IP headers, which will include the source address, the destination address, port number, all of that information is in the IP header. Then it's going to go down one more layer. It will arrive at the Ethernet layer. You add an Ethernet frame information to it and so on. Okay? So you will see that you have a payload and then each layer has added its own bit of information in the form of headers. Okay, the packet goes down the protocol stack. Okay, it's going to traverse down. Okay, and each layer is going to process its added set and it's going to go over the network. Okay? There may be multiple intermediaries which we are ignoring here. Each, so if you do have routers, they're going to look at the IP headers and process them. Okay? And then as it goes up the protocol stack, you're going to, each layer is going to take the packet as it has arrived, look at the header, which is going to tell it what to do and then hand it over to the next layer. Okay? You can do error checks and whether there are acknowledgements to be sent and so on. So then each of these layers is going to strip the header and send it to the next layer up. So when the packet eventually arrives at the application, it will best have its application level header and the message. And then it will just look at that and process it. And that's how typically a protocol stack would process a packet. Any questions here? Okay, so as far as this, this is not a networking course, obviously, but we are going to be talking about some protocols. Okay? And all the protocols we will talk about in this course are actually going to be what we will refer to as a middleware protocol. Okay? Middleware protocols are the ones that are going to sit over a network protocol stack and add some useful functionality to our distributed application. Okay? Example of a middleware protocol would be something like distributed commit okay? or Paxos, which we are going to again look at in a few lectures, where a set of applications are trying to reach some agreement on uh, some request, okay? saying what, what should we do with the request. Okay, so if you have these general purpose scenarios or those, uh, requirements, not scenario, general purpose requirement, you can implement them between the network protocol stack and the application. You can implement them in the middleware layer and the middleware is going to provide that functionality for you. Okay, so this is basically where we are going to spend some time talking about middleware protocols, not today, but in subsequent classes. Okay? Your uh, RPC systems that we are going to talk about today are also some a simple example of a middleware that sits between the protocol stack and the application. Okay, so with that very quick refresher, I'm going to talk a little bit about TCPA just to give you some sense of uh, what kinds of scenarios might you want to think about when you design client server systems. And then we'll spend much of our time to talk about uh, remote procedure calls to the RPCs. Okay. So let's just talk about uh, TCP first. Okay, so the first figure here which is labeled A shows you all the messages that are going to go back and forth between a client and a server for communication to take place. Okay, so the scenario here is client is sending a request to a server, server is sending a reply back to the client. A very straightforward scenario. Send a request, you get a reply. We are going to assume that the request and reply fit into one network packet. They don't have to. But in this example, we are going to assume that the request is of a small size so it fits in the packet and the response is also going to fit in the packet. Okay. Now, it may seem that since you are sending one request and getting one reply, that are two messages going back and forth. But that's not the case as this slide is going to show you. If you are going to use something like TCP, for you to send that request and reply. There are actually nine messages that get exchanged for the two real messages to actually be exchanged between the client and the server. Then the reason for this is TCP is a connection oriented protocol. So in our, before you even send your first packet, you have to first establish a connection. 
Okay, so there's going to be what is called a TCP handshake that is performed to set up the connection. Once the connection is set up, then you can send messages back and forth. And once you're done communicating, you have to tear down that connection for which you need to send additional messages. So there's a connection set up over it and a connection tear down over it that is going to be incurred every time you want to do this message exchange over a new TCP connection. That is essentially what is shown here. Okay? So the first three messages are essentially your connection setup. This is called a three-way TCP handshake. You send what is called a SYN message, which essentially tells, the, let's say the client is sending it to the server. It tells the server saying, I'm a client, I want to communicate with you over TCP. Okay? Uh, the, since the connection is duplex, it's two-way, the server is going to send a SYN back saying, I would like to communicate with you as well. And it's going to send an ACK saying, I received your SYN. Okay, ACK is basically an acknowledgement. Okay. So that's your second message. And then this client has to send an ACK back saying, okay, I received your SYN. So, uh, and we can now communicate. Okay. So you essentially say, I want to communicate, get an acknowledgement to do this in both directions. So the three message exchanges in order for TCP connection to be established. Okay. At this point, TCP has established a connection between the client and the server. So you're going to send a request packet. Okay. So here is my actual request processing. And if you're only going to send one request, you can tear down the connection in that direction because there's no more data coming. So you, that is done by sending a fin which says I'm done as a finish request. Okay. So now the request is going to be processed by the server. Server is actually going to, uh, while it's processing, it can also send an acknowledgement. Every packet has to be acknowledged in TCP. If the packet is lost, you retransmit. So here, there's no losses, but you still have to send the acknowledgement. Okay, so for these two messages that you send the reply, which is an actual packet, and then you know, as the server is done, so it's going to send a fin to get an ACK for the fin. Okay. So you are essentially sending, I want to set up a connection, get an acknowledgement, here's a request, and you're done, get an acknowledgement, and what all of these messages have to go back and forth. Okay, so for two messages, you are actually have an overhead of seven extra messages. Okay, every time you set up TCP connection, you're going to have this overhead. That clear? Yeah. Now, typically, if you have larger requests or multiple requests, that set up and tear down will get amortized. You may have 100 requests going back and forth, but in many cases where you have only one request and one reply, this is a high overhead you will have to pay. You don't have much choice. Okay. Here is an optimized version of TCP which was designed for client server communication. So, many people have, uh, because TCP is a general protocol, it's not necessary for client server, it can be used for any other arbitrary forms of communication, but in client-server environments where you have a request-response paradigm, there have been some attempts to optimize TCP, which uh, was proposed as a research proposal, never actually got implemented. So you don't see this actually implemented anywhere, but the idea is at least a reasonable one. Okay, so you, what you do is, rather than having multiple messages, you can batch these messages together. You don't want to change the semantics of TCP. That will mean you need a new protocol altogether. Okay. So you want to keep the, the connection set up, all of those uh, semantics as is, but because you have these messages going back and forth, there's nothing wrong in batching them together and sending multiple of those uh, requests into one network packet. These are messages and there are packets, so you just batch these uh, TCP requests into one packet. So here is what is shown, so this collapses those nine messages into three network packets. So the first one says, I want to set up a connection, that's the same, same packet says, here's the request, it's embedded in that packet, and then you send a fin saying, I'm done. Okay, so now you sort of put three of these into one network packet, it went to the server. Okay, server is then going to send one packet back, saying, here's a sin, I want to set up a connection, I want to acknowledge all the three messages you sent. Okay, so that's an act then you also can process the reply and embed the reply and then send a fin saying I'm done sending you the reply. Okay. So you have embedded four packet, four messages into one packet and then the ACK is going to go back saying I received everything. Okay. So now you collapsed your nine packets into three. Okay. But the semantics are unchanged. You know, that's doing the three-way handshake and all of that. Okay. It's an optimization. Uh, it's not used because uh, it requires that both endpoints support that optimization. Because if one endpoint doesn't support the optimization, you have to fall back to the default. Okay, so if you don't have large deployments, you can't use this optimization. 
Yeah, so it stayed at just a proposal, but just to give you some sense of how you can optimize some of these things. Any questions? Is that clear? Okay. Just something to keep in mind that any, every time you do an application level protocol, what is happening underneath is something you have to you know. And all these TCP overheads you have to incur and so on. Okay. The reason HTTP became persistent was because of this overhead. HTTP started this way. Okay. So every time you send a request for a web page and a reply, you have to pay all this extra overhead of setting up connections and tearing down connections. The next request is to the same server saying, okay, I got your HTML page. It seems to have a JPEG image. Send me the image. All of that overhead is repeated. So what they did is they didn't actually optimize TCP, okay? but they optimized HTTP instead which said that don't tear it down when you are done sending the first request. Keep it alive for some time. There will be additional requests you may have to send to the server. Send it on the same connection. Why set up a new connection? You already have one up kind of with the server. So, so basically you have a persistent connection where the, you don't send a pin and start tearing it down as soon as the request has been sent. You just keep it alive for some time. And if additional requests need to be sent, you piggyback them on the same connection. If the connection looks idle for some time, you have a timeout saying nothing is happening on this connection, you send tear it down. Okay, that is how they optimize the performance to take this overhead into account. Okay? Yes. So the red line is still on. It's just a proposed, right? Yeah, the right one is just an idea. It's okay. not really implemented. Okay. Okay, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about push-pull architectures and so on, and then we'll get into remote procedure calls. Uh, now, regardless of what protocol you use and so on uh, underneath, uh, as far as your client-server architecture is concerned, there are two modes of communication, a pull-based approach and a push-based approach. Okay? It's also called client-pull architectures and server-push architectures. Client-pull architectures are nothing but request-reply type uh, scenarios okay, where the client makes a request, server sends a reply. Okay. Essentially, the client is pulling either data or some processed information from the server. Okay. So, you have to always make a request before the server is going to reply to you. Okay. So, that is called a client pull architecture. Everything we have been talking about actually falls into this category. Okay. HTTP is an example. Pretty much any server where the client has to make a request and get a reply is a client pool architecture, very common. Yeah. Now, as in contrast to this, you can also have what are called server push architecture, where the server may asynchronously start pushing data to clients, even without the client explicitly making requests. Okay. The client pool architecture, you have to make an explicit request before the server ever sends you anything a reply. The server push architecture, the server may actually send client some data even if the client did not explicitly send, send me something. Okay. What are examples of server push architecture? There are many. Okay. Streaming of audio and video has uh, been implemented using server push architecture where the server client, which is let's say a browser with a video player, may simply say play. Okay. Once you do this, Okay, then, then that's the first request that goes to the server. The server is just going to keep pushing data. You don't say give me the next 10 seconds of data or the next 10 seconds of data. You could do that too. In fact, there are players that do exactly that. That's a client pool based player. But streaming can just be server push. Right? So play this and then the server keeps sending you data. You just have to keep listening over a network and data is coming to you continuously. You just take it and you start displaying it on the screen. You don't need to keep asking for more. Yeah, and when you're done, you can just say stop and the server will stop sending it. That's an example of server push architecture. Okay. You can think of uh, stock ticker like applications as also an example of server push. Okay. If you look at, uh, uh, just a second, if you look at this TV uh, screens where uh, your business news, you have this stock thing just, just scrolling on the bottom, you can get an application that does the same thing. Okay. So you, the application is continuously updating stock prices. So in this case, you don't need to keep asking the server, saying, what's the price? Okay. You just tell the server, I'm interested in this company. Anytime the stock price changes, send me the update. And the server will just keep pushing the update. Client will receive it and just display the latest update. Another example of server push question. I see you question. My question was, how can you say that now, I wish I don't have 
push. Yeah. So the server needs to know what to push. You have to express interest in it first. That's the only request you are actually going to make. Say, play this movie for me. You go to YouTube, for example, you say, play this clip. So you know what the server knows, what the pro client wants, then it can just start playing, but you don't then ask, give me the first second of the movie, give me the next second. You don't do that all the time. That's what it means to do server push. Now, this is also where you can think about stateful and stateless server. Client pools uh, based architectures can be stateless. Okay, You don't need to know which clients are uh, have been talking to you in the past. If the client needs something and makes a request, you send a reply and you are done. You don't need to keep track of which client was talking to you. Okay? So, so these are often stateless. Okay? Server push architectures are by definition stateful because the client is only going to say, okay, I'm interested in stock price of company X. Okay? And many clients may have registered interest for different prices. So you need to know here are all the clients. This is all that they are interested in. Anytime something interesting happens, I need to figure out whom to send the updates to. So that is all state that the server is going to keep for the clients. Okay? So server push architectures are going to be stateful architectures. Okay? So that's a, also a fundamental difference between uh, client pull and server push architectures. Okay. Now there are other pros and cons. If you are stateless architectures, failures are easier to handle. You just reboot the server. Server is down for some time, but then the client can keep retrying and the server comes back up. The request goes to the server, you get a reply. Okay, so that's straightforward. In server push architectures, because you are keeping state of all the clients and their interest, if you keep this state in memory, okay, if your server goes down, all of that state information is lost. When you come back up, you do not know what was requested by whom because you kept all of that state in RAM, which is what most servers would do. Okay, so in this case, uh, stateful servers are less resilient to failure. Doesn't mean you cannot handle failure, but uh, you have to keep in mind that state can be lost and then somehow you have to regenerate the state and so on. Because you have to have additional things that the client may have to re-request the movie or some such thing has to be done before uh, you can actually start pushing that data again. Okay. Okay, there's also this issue of scalability where uh, in certain key scenarios, client pool architectures may actually have le less scalability than server push simply because of the higher uh, message passing overheads. Okay. In this case, for every piece of data, you have to send a re request and a reply comes back to you. Okay. So for a single data item, you have to send a request, reply. So two messages are going to be exchanged for one data item. In a server push architecture, since the server may know what the client needs, there's no request going. Only the replies are going from the server to the client. Okay? So you can actually implement in certain applications, uh, server push uh, based applications, there uh, uh, will be less message overhead and little more scalability as a result. Question that is. Yeah, so I think you are, uh, so there's a question saying what happens if packet service. So we are not talking now of uh, message exchange at uh, network stack and not TCP message exchange. This is just application so level. How do we make sure the client receives that? Yes, so, uh, so just let me just draw a picture maybe this will be clear uh, as to what's going on. So let's take client pool. Okay. So you send a request. Send a reply. If you want to know that both of these have actually been received, you will have to send an act. Okay. In this case, the reply is acting as an implicit act. You can send an explicit act. If you don't get a reply, you can assume something happened and retransmit. Okay. So no failure case here is actually three messages. Okay. So you ask what happens in server push. Okay. So initially there is so, and then if you have a subsequent request, you will have the same thing, three messages. Okay. So here you basically have something that says let's say play and then find data so this is data being streamed to you this push being pushed to you now if you want to know that this has been received you can actually send an act okay but still there is one less request or typically what happens in server push is you don't send an act it's the client's job to send what is called a negative acknowledgement which is a NAC saying I did not receive it. So default is let's say I'm receiving something, I don't send anything. Okay, but then if you send a negative acknowledgement that reduces this overhead further. So if some pack, so let's say you say data packet one, packet two, and then this packet four comes. 
So you know there's something missing between two and three. So you can set a max like I didn't get three, and three will be retransmitted. So you can have various schemes to optimize the message overhead. So okay. Connection breaks. The server cannot establish the new connection. Like uh, I was playing a video and. Yeah, so the, uh, typically if the connection breaks with the server rebooted or some such thing crashed or something happened in the network, uh, so some state may be lost as a result. Uh, how to handle failures is a different problem. This is not in talking... Case, in case like, there was no failure on the server but connection uh, was broken. So server can't again establish a connection and send packets to the client. Yeah, so question is if the there's no server failure but there's a network failure and then the connection breaks, what should the server do? Okay. Typically that depends on the environment. The client may be actually not reachable over a network because it's behind a firewall. Okay. So there may be practical reasons why even if the server uh, wanted to do something, it may not be able to. So just typically network problems, it is handled by the client side. Okay. You have to decide how you do failure handling. Okay. It's not that uh, you cannot do it. Certain applications you may be able to do. Server may be able to simply re-establish the connection. But typically it's handled on the client end because clients are the ones that may often may be in firewalls, servers are not. Servers are reachable over the internet. Not always, but that's a common scenario. Okay. So that is, yes, question. Uh, so if the server <coughs> is distributed, how does the server push uh, one connection to work? If the server is distributed, how does the server push? Is that your question? Yeah. Okay, so typically if the server is distributed or replicated, that means the functionality of the server is spread across multiple machines, okay, uh, you can do one of many things. When a request comes in, you assign it to one of those servers and that's the server that's going to service this client. Other servers service other clients. Okay, so you basically get mapped down to a single client. So you have a pool of streaming servers, let's say. Right? YouTube is not running on one server, it's running on thousands and thousands of servers. Your request, when you make a request, it's sent to a particular server within that pool and that's the server that's sending you data. Other servers also have the content but you got mapped to a particular machine and that's the server that's sending it to you. Other servers won't touch, uh, uh, not touch, but won't actually interact with this client. Other clients may get mapped down to it. Okay, that's one way to do it. Okay, so that's server push and client uh, uh, pull and we'll come back to this again as we talk about real application. This is just concepts at this point. Okay. Uh, last concept here to keep in mind is uh, group communication, okay, which is also uh, something to keep in mind. Most of the communication that's message oriented or even server push oriented that we have talked about is one to one. There's one entity at both heads. Okay. There's a client and a server. Okay, so there are two parties involved in the communication. Okay, you can also have group communication where there may be one sender and multiple recipients. Okay, this is often done using broadcasts or multicasts or webcasts or you may have heard of these terms. They are all forms of group communication, essentially one to many communication. Okay, so you want to do one send and multiple entities receive. Okay. Uh, there are many scenarios where this is useful. You can be watching a live show or the internet and maybe it's a sports game that you logged into and now if there are 10,000 users, okay, one way to do this is one to one where the, the same data is being sent by the server 10,000 times. Here is the data, here is the data, you just send it, do 10,000 sends to the 10,000 users. Okay. That's one way you are going to send the same data to everyone who's uh, actually logged in and asked for this content. Another way to do it is ask the network to do it for you. You can say, here's a group of recipients. I'm going to do one send. So I'm going to only send once. The network knows that the packet has to be delivered to n users and it's going to basically send, make copies of the packet inside the network and send it. So the application doesn't have to do n sends. The application does one send and then the network is actually going to distribute that packet to multiple recipients. Okay, this is referred to as group communication. Okay. Simplest form of group communication is broadcast. Okay, where that often happens on a LAN. Okay, you send a packet, it receives, go, is received by every machine on your LAN. Okay, and somebody is going to reply to you. Okay, the broadcast is used for uh, scenarios like DHCP. Okay, you may know what DHCP is. When you plug in your machine on the network, it doesn't have an IP address. You have to acquire an IP address. But often you don't know whom to ask for the IP address. There's a DHCP server somewhere 
they're distributing IP addresses, but you don't know, you just plugged it into some new network, let's say you connected to Wi-Fi, you don't know where the, these, uh, these, uh, the, the server is. So this is often sent as a broadcast packet saying, I need, is there a DHCP server somewhere, I need an IP address. That packet is broadcast, it goes everywhere. Okay? You don't sit and say, IP address, you just in 192 something dot one, send a packet, are you a DHCP server or two? You don't go and ask any, every machine is simply broadcast it once, get a reply. Okay, that's another example of group communication. Okay, often, context of the internet, you're not going to do broadcast, that just doesn't work. You can't send a packet to every machine. You're going to do multicast, which is just always send it to a subset of uh, machines that are express interest in receiving whatever data it is that the server is sending. So this is uh, group communication and as I said, the simplest example of it that you see today is if you tune into live streams okay, of any sort, that is often sent as a multicast. It is not actually done as a network level multicast because that requires network support in the routers, but you can do what is called application level multicast or overlays. You can even use P2P overlays to actually do your uh, implement your multicast. We'll come back to group communication as well uh, after we have done RPCs. So this is just to give you some sense of all the issues that you have to keep in mind. Okay. Questions here? Yes. Suppose uh, recipient delivers the Yeah, well, that's a good question. We'll come when I do multicast, we'll come back to this also. So if you're sending one packet to 100 receivers, okay, uh, one of them didn't receive it, but the other 99 received it. Okay, what should you do? So if one of them did not send you an acknowledgement, so are you going to resend it to all of them, which is completely wasteful, but that's one way to address the issue. Uh, so how would you do it? So there are typically when you have multicast or broadcast, you have negative acknowledgements. Okay, which means you will send saying, I did not receive the packet, but the server is smart enough to know only that machine didn't receive the packet, you don't send it to everyone. You only send the retransmit the packet to the ones who did not receive it. Okay, so you have to be careful. Uh, the reason also you don't receive acknowledgements is you have what is called an ACK explosion that's going to happen. The more receivers there are, if everyone sends ACK, this one sender is going to have to re receive N acknowledgements. So N ACKs come back for every send. As n grows, you can imagine you have go to you send one packet, ten thousand packets come back with acknowledgements. Okay, then you have to process those ten thousand packets. It reduces, increases the load on the server. So you will do something smarter. You will say only tell me if there's a problem. Otherwise, I assume things are fine. Okay, so you will have to implement techniques like this, which we'll come back to as well. Okay, but what I wanted to talk about today are remote procedure calls, and I'll show you quickly some examples. Okay. So these are referred to as RPCs, they stand for remote procedure calls. And the goal of RPCs is to make distributed computing look like centralized computing. Okay. Suppose you want to write a distributed application. Okay. If you are not given any real support, you will have to go learn about networking. Saying I need for uh, two processes running on these two machines to communicate. Okay. How do you do that? You have to learn something about TCP IP, you have to set up a connection, you have to send messages back and forth. So there's a lot of overhead for a programmer, an application programmer to learn before they can actually implement any sort of a distributed application. Question is, can you program your application at a higher level where you, the programmer, don't have to deal with some of these underlying networking and other kinds of communication aspects? Some system takes care of it for you. So you actually write, focus on the application you want to build, not go and become an expert in uh, networking or other things that really you don't need to worry about. Somebody else takes care of it for you. Okay? So that is essentially the goal of most RPC system. You are raising the abstraction out which you program to something that's not higher than going and programming at a fairly low level using network sockets and things like that. So how do you do it? Okay, that's the question. So the essential idea in remote procedure calls is the following. Okay, so uh, rather than uh, if a client wants to make a request to the server, rather than constructing some specific message and then says establishing a connection and sending it, having the other end process the message, look for what type of a message is it, how should you handle it, right? Instead of writing all of that code, what you simply do is 
write the service that you are trying to implement as a set of functions. Okay, the functions could be here is some three functions that I implement. Okay. Now, typically, uh, when you have functions, you have other functions that call functions in the centralized program. That's what you do. If you have a centralized program, you basically you don't write everything in one large main function. You'll have smaller procedures, and one procedure calls other procedures. And we all know how to write code in this fashion. Okay. So now you basically extend the same scenario to a distributed application. So rather than uh, sending messages back and forth, what if you could just call functions back and forth? Okay. So one program or one process is simply calling a function, but the function is not does not reside in this process. It resides on some other process. So you are simply making a function call that's remote. It's not local to the process. It's remote. It resides on some other machine, the code for the function. Okay. So if you program at this level, it makes your life much easier because you know how to write code using methods or functions or whatever you want to call the procedures. And all you have done is you basically have, have some procedures that are remote. They can be called remotely by other processes rather than locally by uh, threads within this process. Okay. So the way this is going to work is very straightforward once you understand the basic idea. So let's say this server. Okay. Okay. So when you write the server, you write a function. Let's say you're just going to write the add function. The add function is simply going to take two arguments, I, and J, add it and send back a reply. Okay. So you write the code for the add function. Now for the client to communicate with the server, if it wants to invoke the add service, it is simply going to make a function call. That's what the code you are going to write. Okay, you are saying, I want to add these two variables and send back a reply. Okay. Now, once you do this, something is going to figure out saying that the actual implementation of the add function is not a local function, it's a remote function. Okay, it actually, the code resides on some other process on other machine and that something is actually going to establish a connection between the client and the server, send a message, invoke ask the server to execute add send back a reply all of that is going to be taken care of for you okay so you have not in this code actually set up a connection at the tcp or udp or whatever protocol and constructed a message saying i want to add and here are the two arguments send that message and process the message none of that is being done by the application programmer doesn't mean it's happening it's actually happening but that code is auto generated for you by the RPC runtime. So you are now programming at a much higher level of abstraction. You are simply writing the server as a set of methods or procedures. Clients are simply invoking methods or procedures on the server and the way you invoke a method is just as you call any other function. You just as think of it, you call a library function. Okay, so just, and it's just that the code is not in this process, it's somewhere else. So you are going to uh, not have to deal with all of the networking aspects that are involved here. Okay, so is it clear why this is a higher level? So, so you are not going to program raw sockets or anything like that. You are simply calling methods and something else is taking care of all of the communication, establishing communication and things like that for you. Okay, so that is basically the idea of a remote procedure call. It makes writing your distributed applications more straightforward. You just you just take your set of procedures and these this code goes in the server, this code goes in the client. How does the client call the server? You just invoke a method on the server. The method has to be a remote procedure, okay, something that the server is willing to accept requests for, and then it just executes the procedure and sends back a reply. Okay, the same thing here when the server executes this method, it doesn't have any code here saying can send a reply back. Okay, you just say here, you just return a value and somebody else takes, somebody else within the runtime system in this case, takes care of sending the reply or the network and whatnot. Okay. So, uh, remote procedure calls uh, have a long history. They were designed in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. But I have a PhD thesis of the person who sort of uh, implemented some of this back in the 80s. Um, and then... It got taken over by commercial operating system and then uh, became very popular subsequently. Okay, so early versions of uh, uh, NFS, which is Network File System, actually are built on 
top of RPCs. That was first big implementation of RPCs in those systems. Now you can use RPC system to write whatever application you want. Many languages support RPCs and so on. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is a little more detail of how RPCs work. Okay, so I think I have a picture somewhere here. So here's the same picture that I drew here. So here's your client machine, server machine. Okay, you are basically server is only providing an ad service. You can call ad, provide two arguments. It will sum the two arguments, send back a reply. It could be any service, but here you have the ad service. So you write code to implement the ad function here. It sits in the server. Okay, client is simply going to call ad as if it was a local procedure. Okay, and then here is the you know, anything below this line is actually the RPC runtime system. So when you call ad, the RPC runtime figures this code actually resides somewhere else made of so packet that can say here's a procedure called add here are two values for your parameters send this packet over a network okay? comes at the other end this runtime system that's part of the applications are called stubs we'll talk about them in just a moment okay so here the packet came in so then the stub says okay here is the procedure i need to invoke so you call add get a reply same thing happens in reverse construct a message send it back okay so this part of constructing all of the messages is still going on underneath. The programmer is not dealing with all of that. You are simply calling functions. Something else deals with it for you. Yes? Is there an accepted uh, way of handling updates? For instance, uh, step six says stub makes a local call to add. <coughs> if add has been redefined on either the client or the server, is the interpretation of what this function means? Is okay. there sort of like a standard way? Okay, so this question is if you actually server gets updated, implements new version of add, even implements new procedures that are not export, is there a standard way? There is no particular standard way, it depends on the language. Uh, in C, you basically have a version of the server. So you basically say, I want to invoke add and you say the interface version I want is X and so you can define multiple versions which could be multiple implementation. So you can have the old version of the server with add and a new process that implements new add. When the client connects, if it specifies the version, then the RPC runtime is going to send it to the right version. So you can, that's one way you can do it. Okay, but there are others as well. So any other questions? Okay, so from uh, the client's perspective, calling a remote procedure looks more different from calling a local procedure. Okay, the, here is a timeline of what's happening. Local procedures are essentially blocking calls. When you make a local function call, okay, the callee, uh, the, rather the caller is going to wait for the function to return with some reply, uh, with some return value. Same is true here. Okay, so here you have the client, which is the caller. Caller makes a procedure call, just happens to be remote. So the caller is going to wait for the procedure to compute and return a value. Okay, it's just that the wait is going to be a little longer because you're going to send a network request. Server is going to compute a response, send it back to you. And when the response comes back, the function just returns with a value as if you just called a local library function. Okay, so same blocking uh, call abstraction holds for remote procedure call. There are other semantics we are going to look at, okay, but that's the default one. Okay, questions here? Yes. In the previous example, uh, we were sending values over the when making the remote procedure calls. So instead, we were sending references. Yes, I'll come to references in just a moment. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to just skip this because this is just saying the same things. So if in a local procedure calls, you call something in the local uh, process. Remote procedure calls, you're not going to do this. You're going to send a network packet. Okay, so this is not. Important, so I'll just come back to what was just asked, which is parameter passing. Okay. Now, there are some important differences, although calling remote procedures looks more or less similar to calling local procedures that are inside your process or inside a library linked to the process. There are nevertheless some important differences to keep in mind. Okay. One difference is how parameters are passed. When your local procedures, you have two choices often, depends on the language, okay, but there are two choices, which is you can call by value or call by reference. Okay. Call by value says that when you provide an argument to a pro function call, okay, you make a copy of that variable and give it to the uh, call function. Okay. The call function operates on the copy. When you call by reference, you are given a reference with essentially a pointer to the argument. Okay. So that means you can actually change the original argument as well. Okay. 
So you have these two uh, uh, ways by which you can actually pass any parameter, call by value or call by reference. That's pretty uh, standard stuff in any programming language. Okay? Now when you have remote procedure calls, uh, there are some important differences. By default, you only, you will only do call by value. Okay? Call by reference essentially means that you are going to pass a pointer. Okay? You pass a pointer to some other machine. Okay? Pointer is essentially a memory address. Okay? You pass a pointer to a second machine. That memory address is meaningless on the second machine because of the memory address on the first machine. Okay? So if you try to dereference the pointer, you look at that memory address on that machine which doesn't mean anything from the uh, program perspective. Okay. So passing pointers by default in many RPC systems is not allowed. Okay. There are some systems that will allow it. We look at Java RMIs where you can pass by reference, but this requires you to dereference network pointers, which is the much more complicated than dereferencing a memory pointer. Dereferencing a memory pointer simply says, look at the memory address in the pointer, go look at that memory location and you're done. If you want to dereference a network pointer, the network pointer will need to have an IP address and there has to be a specific way to dereference it because you have to go to some other machine and look at its memory location that is sort of specified in the address. It's a lot more complicated to do. Okay, often it is not even done in many systems. Okay? So that's one important difference which is you are not going to allow parameter passing by reference. You are only going to pass that by value which essentially says make a copy and send it. That's what's happening when you send a network packet. You're sending a copy of those arguments. Okay. Another related issue is you don't want to use global variables. Because again, they don't mean anything. A global variable in the client process is not accessible to the server process. Okay. So you can't write code that accesses global variables because they don't actually mean anything in some context. Okay. So you want to avoid some of these uh, pitfalls. Any questions here? Okay, I'll come to flattening mask. So I'm going to talk about stubs and talk about parameter passing, etc. Okay, uh, the next slide. Okay, so now with all of this uh, concepts, let's just think a little bit about how to implement uh, RPC system. So client is going to make a procedure call. Looks like calling a local procedure. Okay, server is going to implement that procedure call. The code is residing on the server. So now your RPC system has to construct this packet I was talking about make a packet and send it. Okay. Now that, so that's done by a code called a stub code that's going to be generated for you. But uh, the creating this packet is more complicated than it may seem because there are several important things you'll have to keep in mind. First thing you have to keep in mind is how do you send a parameter? Okay. If it's integer, it's easy to send. Okay. What if it's a struct? What if it's an array? What if it's a two-dimensional array? You need some way by which you can take some more complicated data structure, put it into a packet and regenerate that data structure. What is coming to you is a set of bytes in a packet. You have to now reconstruct that data structure at the other end. Okay? So you need to have some rules that you agree on saying, if I have a two-dimensional array, I am going to send it row-wise, not column-wise. So if you reconstruct it column-wise at the other end, your array will flip and you will have the wrong array reconstructed. So you need some rules that you can pass more complicated data structures. Okay? So this is referred to as marshalling and demarshalling of arguments where you take any arbitrary variable, you then construct a linear sequence of bytes, you put it into a packet, you send it, and at the other end, you essentially something like typecasting it back to what it was. Okay? And see if you're actually done typecasting, you know what I'm talking about. You essentially have bits, you cast it and it makes a new structure out of it. It's the same thing you have to do here. But you need to agree on these rules up front okay, as to how that is done. Okay, and there are many other important problems you have to deal with in marshalling, demarshalling of arguments. One is dealing with client-server heterogeneity. Okay. Nowhere have we said that the client and the server are going to run the same OS, they are going to be the same platform, etc. In fact, when you talk to a server, you can't actually, if your web browser is sending a request to a HTTP server, there's no uh, requirement that the HTTP server run Mac because you are sending this from a Mac. Okay? Same is true in RPC system. Client and the server may run on arbitrary platforms. They may be heterogeneous platform. They may not even be the same instructions and same OS, okay? same code and so on. 
to have this kinds of problems occur you have to deal with additional architecture level differences for example is the client little indian server big indian you know little indian big indian I assume. and so which is saying we do you read bits left to right or left to right where is the least significant bit where is the most significant some architectures are little indian you read bits one way other architecture little indian which means that the least significant bit goes the other way Okay. Now, if you set a simple integer, this add integer that we add program we send, is going to be sent as, let's say it's a 32-bit system, is going to be sent as 32 bits. Okay. Now, if the server, you are little Indian, the server is big Indian, if it reads the same bits backwards, your integer, the value that you send will be misinterpreted at the other end. It will just construct things that's a different integer from the one you sent. Okay. So, these simple details matter. Okay. And because you cannot assume that the server has a certain architecture what you have to do is always convert whatever your native format is to an, a format called an XDR format which is a format everything everyone agrees on. Okay. So let's say when you convert everything to XDR you assume all XDR data is little Indian. You make an assumption. So now if you are big Indian you have to actually send the bits by flipping them and sending them in XDR format when it reaches the other end because you know what XDR is, you can convert that to whatever format you are little Indian or big Indian. As an example of things you may have to do. Okay. So this is a protocol. You are agreeing that any packet I send to you has to be read as a, uh, in an XDR format, which I, for the sake of example, let's say always little Indian, independent of what the client and the server are running. So you always translate and then you translate back to your native format. Okay. All of this has to be done by uh, the RPC runtime system. If you are writing code, you would actually have to do this yourself, some of this. Okay? But the code is going to do this for you. Okay? Pointers, I said, we already prohibit, so we are not going to deal with it here. Okay? But all of the rest, you still have to do. Packaging arguments is more complicated than. Okay? So I'm going to uh, skip this. And I wanted to, since we are running behind, show you an example okay? So of RPC systems. And this is the example. Okay, so this is how you would actually write a program with RPCs. I'm going to show you a small piece of code as well. Okay, so you are going to write a specification file. It's also called in some language an ideal interface definition. Okay, this is going to say these are the procedures that the server is exporting. Okay, you write this as a .x file. And then you write the client code and the server code as simple procedure. The server has to implement that these, these procedures and some other local procedures for its own uh, application. And the client is going to call some of these procedures. So you will take all of this code. This is actually in C. Okay, this is you can have similar things in other languages. So you'll take the interface and you'll run it through a special compiler which is an RPC compiler. In C this is called an RPC gen compiler. So you run it through RPC gen. It is going to auto generate some code for you. Okay? So here it took this and it generated the client stuff code, generated the server stuff code, it generated some additional header files also generate all this XTR code that you link to the client and the server. Okay, so you got some additional C files in this case. So then you will take the client code which is written in C, some of this code, you will compile it together, you will have the client binary. Okay, so the stub is now going to be linked to the client, so that's going to do all of that extra work of packaging, and, uh, unpackaging and sending uh, stuff over the network and so on. So that will be a client application. Same thing will happen with the server application. So you have two compilers, an RPC compiler and an actual C compiler. The RPC compiler first runs and auto generates some additional code, which then you take with you and your, your code and that code and you compile your application. Okay. This is a standard pipeline for any uh, RPC-like system. Okay. You will have an interface definition, there are some tools that will auto generate some extra code for you. Then you will take all of that and create a binary. Okay, so I'm going to show an example and then we'll stop for today. Okay, so this is uh, an example that's going to show add. I don't know how many of you will see this, but let's look at add. Okay, so, so here is our add.x. Okay, this is simply saying this is the interface. Okay, so here's a version I had. This was the question that was asked. So you'll say this is the full version of add 1.1.0 or whatever. And here is basically my add function. It is going to take two variables as parameters in two integers a and b. So this is the interface you have actually implemented. Okay, let's look at. Uh, so this is the. 
So you have the server code, which is a very simple program, but the basic part is here. And that is the implementation of your add program, where you take two arguments, you're simply adding them up and sending the result. So this, there's no networking code here, as you see. You simply implemented an add function. Okay, so, so that's your client is here. Okay, this is the client code. Okay, this is where you actually invoke the server. So you basically call add. You have add underscore one. That's the version number you can ignore, but you just called an add function. Okay, this is our remote procedure call. It just looks like you called a local procedure with some parameter. Again, you'll see that you did not have to send any packet, any of that. That's going to be done by the stub. Okay. There is some initial binding that we will look at in a little while, okay, which uh, you are ignoring. But once you do that, there is no additional networking stuff you have to write. Okay. So that is essentially our uh, server code that you wrote as a program. This is what a programmer would write. Okay. These are the three files. And then you will run it through. I'm just going to run make, which is going to do all of the steps. It's going to run an RPC gen. It's going to call uh, some C compilers and some warnings you can ignore. But essentially what happened at the end of this is you'll see a lot of additional files got generated. In particular, you'll see there is some XDR code, which actually is not going to call an XDR library. So there isn't a whole lot there. Okay, so that's your XDR code. You'll see the client stub. Okay, so there is some stub code. So you'll see all the networking code is actually being written. So there's some transport level stuff happening here. So all the socket connections are actually being done for you automatically. So registering the service, all of that is actually being handled by auto-generated code. Okay, and then there is also the actual server stuff. The server stuff. Okay, so this is your client stuff which doesn't do much. It's essentially it's saying the same thing. So you'll see that it will say it is auto generated. <coughs> so this is the one that's going to actually call. This is the client call which goes to the RPC runtime saying I need to call to the server. This is the add function. So it will do all the right stuff in the libraries. Okay, so this is basically going to go into the RPC libraries and do all of it. So you got all this code auto generated, you linked it and then you have uh, that's the client and that's the server. If you run it, it's actually going to allow you to take two arguments, send it to the server and send a reply. Okay, ideally you want to run them in different machines and whatnot. So I won't do that part here. Okay, so that's just a simple pipeline to show you how RPCs work and whatnot. Any questions here? We need to end early today. We'll continue uh, discussion of little bit that's left and talk about RPCs in the Java world, which are RMIs, remote method invocation next time. Yes. Uh, so which command is the input to uh, generating these additional files? I missed. Uh, uh, it's an, uh, you just call the RPC compiler. In C, it's called RPC gen. Okay, so in different languages will have their own RPC compiler. So if you actually look at what make would have done here, you'll see that the first thing it would do is we call this RPC gen add dot x. Right? So that's an RPC compiler that's going to generate that code. Right? But that again depends on your language. That's not a standard command. That's a language dependent compiler. Okay. Okay. So if uh, there are no other questions, I'm going to stop it here today and we will continue this discussion with the Java RMIs next time. Okay.